Right, uh, good evening everyone. Welcome to tonight's Audit and Governance Committee on Wednesday the 27th of September. Uh, item number one is uh, apologies for absence. Uh, got uh, Councillor Price, is there any more? Nope. Uh, item number two, minutes of the previous meeting. Uh, ask for a mover and a seconder please. Uh, Councillor Clark moved, second to Councillor Daniels, and all those that were present. Yep. Yeah. Uh, item number three, declaration of interest. Has anybody got any declarations they need to make? Nope. Uh, item number four, audit findings, report, and management presentation letter. And I would like to hand over to the auditors, please. Thank you, Chair. The report I'm presenting tonight is the audit finders report for the 2022-23 financial statements audit. I'll take the report as read and just pull out some of the key points. So on page four, we set out the items which are outstanding at the time of writing the report, and there has been some movement on these in the last week or so. So debtors, creditors and operating expenditure testing has now been completed and management have provided responses in relation to the business rates appeals provision. We've also completed our work on the financial instruments disclosures, but these are all subject to myself and Laura Lynn's final reviews. We're anticipating that we'll be, able to be in a position to start an unmodified opinion by the end of October once we've received assurances from the pension fund order, auditor. Uh, we're anticipating that we will issue our auditor's annual report in relation to the value for money work by the end of January 24, and there's a letter at the end of the report which is addressed to the chair just setting out the reasons for this. Our findings against the significant risks which we identified within our audit plan are set out from page 8. In relation to management override of controls, the journal's work is complete but it's subject to final review. We've not identified any issues at this stage and in relation to the estimates, I'll just come on to those separately. So in relation to fraudulent revenue and expenditure recognition, we identified an error in relation to invoices received after the year end. So this relates to an Equans invoice and essentially whilst there is an accrual in the financial statements, management couldn't prove to us that the invoice we'd selected was within that accrual. Uh, so we've looked at what we think the impact could be and just isolated on Equans invoices because we didn't find any issues elsewhere and that is reported within Appendix C. The impact wasn't material and it was below our performance materiality. Our work is not yet complete with regards to the valuation of council dwellings or land and buildings. So we're in discussions with the value for one matter on council dwellings and we're awaiting their response though whilst I was travelling over here they have now responded. So I'll look at that afterwards. Uh, and for land and buildings we've identified an error with regard to the valuations being incorrectly marked as the land element of the building and then vice versa which had an impact on the revaluation reserve. So whilst the actual property plant and equipment value in the balance sheet was correct for this one the revaluation reserve was incorrect because of the valuations being marked against the wrong asset the second error relates to the valuation of garages which were overstated by 565k uh, and this reduced the double counting of the land value management are not proposing to adjust for that and it is set out again within appendix c we've also identified that rental income in relation to other land and buildings had been miscoded to investment property and the impact of this was 68k and that just affects where it sits on the CIES so at the moment it sits below the net cost of services whereas it should sit above and hit that net cost of services line our work on the net pension fund asset is not yet complete as we're awaiting the assurances from the pension fund orders that I spoke about earlier um, and we followed up on the prior recommendations in appendix b and in our final audit findings report, we'll update as to whether they have been closed or not by management. Appendix C sets out our adjusted and unadjusted misstatements, which have been identified to date. The big one is that one I covered earlier, that 565k. Um, and Appendix F sets out the management's letter of representation, which we asked the committee to approve. I'm happy to take any questions. Cheers, thank you. Uh, any questions from the floor? Uh, Councillor Daniels. Good evening. Thank you for the really comprehensive report. Um, this may not be the right place, and I'm sorry if it's not, but in terms of that example of, say, that mistake, uh, what lessons are learned and what steps can we as a council take to make sure it doesn't happen again? Thank you.
Is that the revaluations one? Yeah. So I think it just comes down to management just taking a step back and reviewing the values report again, essentially, and looking for those unusual movements. I know management already do a lot of work looking at the values report, but it's something that sort of JLL can learn from as well as management as well and just look at the movements, essentially, I think, in a little bit more detail to see if anything jumps out. Anybody else? No. Uh, just like to say uh, thank you, and uh, the recommendation is just to confirm the representation letter. Uh, I'm happy to move that if get a seconder, uh, council clerk, and all those in favour. Brilliant. Thank you. Uh, item number five is the annual statement of accounts and report 2022 uh, and I'd like to pass over to the officer. Thank you. Thank you. So following on from Will's update, this is the annual statement of accounts and report for 2022-23. Uh, members are asked to approve the annual statement of accounts and also to delegate authority to the Chair of the Audit and Governance Committee to approve any changes and re-sign the accounts, if necessary, once the audit is concluded by the external auditors. So, by way of background, legislation detailed in Accounts and Audit England Regulations 2015 requires a Committee of the Council to approve the annual statement of accounts and for the Council to publish the statement, together with the auditor's opinion, by 31st of July. However, because of the impact of continuing issues regarding accounts and audit completion, this requirement was amended again for 22-23, with the deadline for publishing audited statements being pushed back to the 30th of September 22-23. The final draft accounts, as signed by the Executive Director of Finance, were issued to the External Auditor and published on the Council's website on the 22nd of June, and Grant Thornton commenced their audit at the beginning of July. Following identification as part of the audit, a number of amendments to the draft accounts have been discussed and agreed with Grant Thornton and have been actioned within the final statement of accounts for 22-23 as attached at Appendix 1. It is important to note that these adjustments relate to presentational or disclosure issues and have not changed the overall figures within the main financial statements. It has previously been reported to members that as a result of the need to close the accounts earlier, it is more likely that there may be changes required to the draft accounts before they are finalised. The external auditors have, during the course of their audit, identified a number of misstatements as set out in their audit findings report. However, the impact of these is less than the 1.25 million materiality limit and therefore does not require any amendments to the accounts. The report includes the year-end position and main variances with regard to general fund, HRA revenue and capital. There is no material change from the provisional outturn position previously reported. Regulations require the Chair of the Audit and Governance Committee to sign and date the Statement of Accounts with the intention that the Chair's signature formally represents the completion of the Council's approval process of the, of the accounts. However, as Will has said, whilst the external auditors have completed the vast majority of their work, we have been advised that concluding work is still needed and the opinion on the accounts is not yet available pending completion of the audit. For this reason, it is proposed to delegate authority to the Chair to approve any changes and re-sign the accounts if necessary once this work is complete and the audit can be, then be concluded. Members of Audit and Governance Committee will be advised of any significant changes at the earliest available opportunity. Happy to take any questions. Thank you. Cheers. Thank, thank you. Uh, any questions from the floor? No. No. So, so obviously the recommendation is for uh, delegation to be put to myself. Uh, does somebody else want to move that and second that? So moved by... Councillor Clark and seconding by Councillor Daniels and all those in favour? Yeah. Uh, cheers, thank you very much. Uh, item number six is the Risk Management Quarterly Update, Quarter 1, 2023-24, and uh, pass over to Assistant Director, Finance. Cheers. 
Thank you. Um, so this is the regular quarterly risk management update for the committee for quarter one of the 23-24 financial year. A copy of the current corporate risk register is attached at Appendix 1. The corporate risk register has been reviewed and updated by CMT for 23-24, following the independent appraisal and feedback received from the Directorate and CMT risk workshops hosted by Zurich Municipal during June and July 2023. A number of changes have been made, with some risks being merged and renamed and new risks added. Corporate risks 2 and 5 modernisation and commercial agenda and economic growth and sustainability have been merged and renamed inability to deliver economic growth, sustainability and prosperity in the borough, risk number eight. Corporate risk four, community focus, has been replaced with promoting community resilience and cohesive communities. Four new corporate risk headings have been identified for 23-24 promoting community resilience and cohesive communities, as just mentioned, lack of resources, capacity and right skills in place, which is risk number four, failure to meet climate change ambitions, meet net zero targets and plan for major weather impacts, risk number six, information and data management, risk number seven. Causes, consequences, risk scores and control measures have been updated for all existing risks for 23-24 as well as the new risks identified. There are still some areas to be updated further um, with regard to the new risks linking them to the corporate priorities and latest note updates as well. The committee is asked to endorse the corporate risk register. I'm happy to take any questions, thank you. Any questions from the floor? I think for me it was just an observation uh, that, that we spoke about in, in the pre-meet, just, just that I'd like to see some notes on action, actions uh, being taken, not just the, the causes and, and the effects. Uh, okay, so the recommendation is to endorse the quarter one report. I'm happy to move that second. Council Clerk, all those in favour? Uh, so, item number seven, regulation of investigatory powers Act 2000, and a pass over to Assistant Director Partnerships. Thank you, Chair. Um, this report is the annual report to Audit and Governance uh, around um, considering the compliance, the Council's compliance with the regulation of investigatory powers Act, uh, RIPA. Um, for this year. So the, the committee will see from the, there the updated, we've reviewed the policy that's in place for coverts and directed surveillance. Um, we've reviewed that policy uh, as, as Appendix 1. Uh, we've also had following a, um, an, an audit um, by the Investigatory, um, Commission, Investigatory Powers Commissioner's Office, IPCO, um, have um, formally stated that Tamworth is uh, compliant with the regulations. Um, and as you'll see, we've had no directed surveillance carried out by the council during 22-23 and no authorisations for the use of covert human intelligence sources. And it's not envisaged that this will be a uh, change in the foreseeable future. Uh, for members' information, uh, RIPA authorities are required where we may be prosecuting or investigating somebody where there is a six months custodial sentence. Um, and it would needs to go through a magistrate's court. We have all the paper in the background, all the information that's stored where we need to record. And I remain the um, senior, the, the, the officer responsible for, for RIPA. Um, it does not include things where we can do covert, overt surveillance, um, using through our public CCTV systems, or where we have signs up that say CCTV is, is, is in operation. Um, so the committee really is just asked to endorse the report, uh, the RIPA monitoring report, and consider the recent audit findings and endorse. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Chair, do you have any questions from the floor? No. Uh, just good that it hasn't been used and good that it's all fine. Uh, I would, so we're being asked to endorse the report. I'd like to move it. Second, Council Clerk, all those in favour? Uh, item number eight, we've got a Modern Slavery Statement 2022-23. Uh, and again, pass over to Jack. 
Thank you, Chair. Um, this report is, um, again, an annual report for the committee to endorse the Council's Modern Slavery and Human Trafficking Statement. Um, we have a requirement under the Modern Slavery Act 2015 um, for, as, for all organisations which supply goods or services from or to the UK and have a global turnover above 36 million to publish a slavery and human trafficking statement, um, which actually looks to endorse what we do through our um, supply chains and procurement chains and also what we do to act um, more broadly to um, prevent and report modern slavery. So each year we need to do a statement that looks back over the previous financial year to be published by the 30th of September. So this is for activities during 22-23 and also what we propose moving forward um, and, and actually for publication. So the trafficking statement, um, modern slavery statement is actually attached as appendices and the committee is asked to endorse that. Uh, for publication on the council website in accordance with the Modern Slavery Act 2015. Thank you, Chair. Cheers, Chair. Uh, any questions from the floor? Nope. Uh, so, the recommendation is to endorse or move, move um, uh, Councillor council for a good second. Uh, all those in favour? Uh, item number nine is the Local Government and Social Care Ombudsman Annual Review 2022-23 uh, and it's the report of the Assistant Director People. Thank you Chair. Um, as the Monitoring Officer, I'm uh, producing this report for um, the Assistant Director of People. Uh, the purpose of this report this evening is to advise the Committee of the contents of the Local Government and Social Care Ombudsman Annual Review Letter for the year ended 31st of March 2023. The Local Government and Social Care Ombudsman produces an annual letter setting out the statistics about complaints relating to the Council that have been referred to them. The letter was published on the 19th of July and a copy can be found at Appendix 1. In addition to this, all decisions made by the Ombudsman regarding complaints against the Council can be found on their website and a link has been provided within the report. The annual letter, as you will see in the report, um, reports that for the period reported, two decisions out of two investigations were upheld, given a statistic of 100% of complaints upheld in comparison to 59% in similar organisations. Now, I know this percentage looks extremely high in terms of performance, and it is skewed by the low number of complaints that have been received by the Council. The letter also from the uh, Ombudsman also notes that they have advised that they have changed their investigation processes, which has contributed to an increase in the average upheld against all complaints, and as such, comparisons should not be made against previous years. Uh, compliance with recommendations by the Ombudsman, <coughs> in both cases we had done so achieving 100% compliance, which is the same when compared to similar organisations, and the percentage of upheld, upheld cases where the Council provides a secretary <coughs> remedy before the complaint reached the Ombudsman, in this reporting period we had not provided satisfactory remedies to the two upheld com uh, cases in comparison to an average of around 15% in similar organisations, and I'll go into some further details in the report with regards to those complaints. Uh, during this reporting period it was necessary for the Council to seek an extension in time to respond to two of the Ombudsman inquiries, although in both cases the link <coughs> officer discussed the cases and agreed extensions with them, the Ombudsman still registers these as a late response. Details of the complaints and inquiries received from the Ombudsman along with the decisions made is detailed in section 4.2 of this report and a full breakdown is available also at appendix 2. Um, in summary, um, 11 inquiries, complaints and decisions were made by the Ombudsman in this reporting period following an assessment. Four complaints were closed before contact was made with the Council and seven complaints progressed further in order to assess in, um, if full investigation was necessary. Following this assessment by the Ombudsman, three complaints and inquiries were closed after their initial inquiries. One complaint was referred back to the Council for local resolution as the, complaint held, as the complainant had not exhausted the Council's process. One complaint was deemed as incomplete or invalid as there was insufficient information to proceed with the investigation. And then we have the two complaints that were passed on for detailed investigations and the complaints were upheld by the Ombudsman. The two complaints investigated were from the same customer about the same issue several months apart, uh, but were determined on the same day. 
So complaint one was about the council's inaction in dealing with a customer's <coughs> report of a neighbour making low frequency noise to annoy them and the customer's dissatisfaction with a decision to restrict access to the council and via a single point of contact. The Ombudsman view was the council had taken appropriate action to deal with the complaints report. However, they did find the council at fault as the council did not advise the complainant that they could appeal the decision on restricting their contact. The recommendations included apologising for not advising them of the right to appeal, um, uh, the decision on restricting contact, review of their restrictions, including the right to appeal and the template letter that we use to be reviewed and updated. All these recommendations were actioned and the Ombudsman has confirmed the remedies have been satisfied. Um, the full anonymised report from the Ombudsman is, um, can be found at Appendix 3. Complaint 2. Walls was about the council's lack of action in dealing with noise, nuisance, antisocial behaviour from the complainant's neighbour. The Ombudsman investigation found the council considered the issue but decided the noise was not statutory nuisance or antisocial. The Ombudsman decided that they could not question the merits of that decision, however did uphold the complaint because of the council's delayed response to the complainant. A uh, the recommendations was a letter of an apology was issued to the complainant regarding the delay in responding and therefore the Ombudsman concluded that there was not enough remaining injustice to warrant further action and that the remedy was complete and satisfied. And a copy <coughs> of the uh, uh, anonymised report can be found at Appendix 4. The Council does remain committed to co in continuous improvement and to learning from complaints to improve the service delivery and customer satisfaction and to support this a number of actions detailed within the report are planned for 23-24 and some of those are around the uh, reporting of compliance and centralised team um, to monitor uh, and improve that complaints process. Um, it is therefore the link officer will also continue to attend focus groups and workshops to seek and develop a unified as the LGSCO as they seek to develop a unified code of practice with the housing ombudsman. It is asked therefore the committee to endorse the contents of the ombudsman annual review letter and the summary of complaints, decisions and compliance contained within it. Thank you Chair and I'm happy to take any questions. Cheers. Uh, any questions from the floor? Councillor Daniels, who's first? Thank you very much for the level of detail <coughs> and I'm absolutely delighted that we have um, Assistant Director Sands here this evening because as I was reading through that particular issue that the Ombudsman upheld, um, were they someone who I work with in my day job, we would be looking to support them with SCND or mental health concerns. And I wondered whether as part of that process there's any kind of cross party of the council work to kind of support cases if it feels like maybe that's the support which is needed rather than say a response to a noise complaint. This is, the, this is more about the actual complaint rather than the decision of the Ombudsman about how that was uh, dealt with. And yes, if we find that people um, in general, if their complaints are, it's very difficult. We can't say to somebody, please, you know, um, maybe you, you may need further support. Um, but that is actually something that we might consider during a, a yeah, vulnerability partnership. And we've, we've discussed this particular case several times and, and has there has been support offered thank you very much sorry peter yeah good neighbor agreements what are they and how are they upheld once they're signed because i'm sure that probably people will sign them and then 10 minutes later the problem's still there uh, I think that this might be more of a question when it comes up in corporate scrutiny with the, the, the yeah. with, with the uh, the actual complaints. Yeah. That this is just actually looking at the the ombudsman's re reports. Mm -hmm. So, so okay. I mean, I can, it, it, it can be answered. I yeah. I can, I can, I can, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. A good um, a good neighbour agreement is a low level antisocial behaviour resolution agreement, rather, and it, it's it's detailed in our ASB policy and in our corporate enforcement policy. Mm -hmm. It's a it's a, a rather than jumping straight into formal action, <coughs> we would try and resolve something with neighbours prior to taking formal action, if that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. So we totally. try and get both neighbours or to, to to agree to sign um, and. Uh, at that point, um, if there is a breach of a good neighbour agreement, that's when we start to take further formal actions. Fair enough. Thank you.
That's all right. I, I actually recognise this patch issue. <laughs> so, uh, any... I know more about the background of it, but unfortunately I'm not going to share it. Any more for any more? Uh, I mean, for me, it was, it was good to see that, that the actual su substance of the complaint wasn't on hold. It was, it was more about the, the, the communication given after a correct decision mm -hmm. uh, as such. Um, so the recommendation is just to endorse the, the review. Uh, I'll move that. Councillor, Councillor Furgood, uh, all those in favour? So item number 10 is just the Audit and Governance Committee timetable. Um, since it, it was published, uh, there was just um, two movements and it is the risk management report to move from October to November and AZ2 will be the, the new uh, external auditors uh, to basically come in and introduce themselves on the November meeting. Everyone okay with that? Obviously it'll be updated on the on, on the next next uh, load up onto onto the the website. Uh, any questions? No? Uh, in that case I'd just like to close the meeting and thank all the officers for attending and uh, the external auditor and good evening everyone. Cheers.